we'd like to begin by welcoming you all here today for this year's Community Development Block Grant, or CDBG, Community Needs Assessment Public Hearing. I'm Krista Lammers from the City of Kalispell, and I'd like to note that this year's hearing will be recorded and filmed to be aired on Spectrum Government Access Channel 190. To be mindful of everyone's time, it's our hope that we can accommodate all of those who would like to offer comment within a two-hour time frame. CDBG Community Needs Assessment public hearing dates and times are set in accordance with the needs of our community members and organizations, which we have found to be during daytime hours and ahead of most of the CDBG application deadlines. Um, and also, if you haven't signed in, please sign in. I'd like to thank our community partners who've worked with the City of Kalispell this year to hold this um, hearing. Uh, Flathead County, Montana West Economic Development, NeighborWorks Montana, the Northwest Montana Community Land Trust, Flathead Valley Community College, Kalispell Public Schools, Samaritan House, Kalispell Regional Healthcare, and United Way. The Community Development Block Grant and Home Programs are flexible programs that provide communities with the resources to address a wide range of unique housing and community development needs. This hearing is considered our annual meeting to identify public needs for Kalispell, Flathead County, and the surrounding community and complies with state and federal guidelines for such. Funding for these grants comes from the Department of Housing and Urban Development and is allocated to the state of Montana. City and county government entities are eligible to apply for this very competitive funding source. We often partner with local organizations on community projects to apply for these funds. Organizations that are interested in CDBG or home grants should contact the county or city to discuss community projects. CDBG and home program funding areas include planning, housing, economic development, and community facilities. Goals of the CDBG and home program, according to the state of Montana and its consolidated plan, are to help empower local governments and communities across the state by building the capacity, resiliency, and resource base necessary to develop strong, vibrant communities and fund projects that principally benefit Montana's low to moderate income households and individuals. This goal can be achieved through providing decent housing, suitable living environments, expanding economic opportunities for the state's low and moderate income residents, all done through maximizing and effectively utilizing all available funding sources. The CDBG and home programs are unique in their principles of local decision making, flexible use of funds for local needs, citizen participation, leveraging investments through partnerships, and strategic targeting of funds in areas of need. For more information, please visit the State of Montana website or call the number shown. You can also visit the Housing and Urban Development website, or you can contact the city or county. The state of Montana's CDBG funding amounts are determined by HUD each year. When funding is received, the Montana Department of Commerce sets application deadlines. Please see their website for those deadlines. Montana CDBG and home funds are granted to further the five goals of preserving and construct construction of affordable housing, community planning, improving and sustaining public infrastructure, revitalizing economies, and reducing homelessness. Locally, we've seen CDBG funding at work in projects like the Flathead Youth Home, Flathead Valley Community College's Heavy Equipment Operators Training Program, and most recently at the Flathead County Fairgrounds for ADA Improvements. You as public agencies, community organizations, and community members join us today so that we may offer our insights into the current needs of our community. With that, I'll invite those organizations and community members to come to the podium. If you'd please introduce yourselves and if applicable, applicable the organization that you're with. And then I'll wrap up at the end.
Um, my name is Whitney Ashwald. I'm the grant administrator for Flathead County. And just to kind of give a follow-up to Krista's introduction, I wanted to go over some of those grant deadlines with you. And again, like Krista mentioned, please always check their website for the final deadlines. But to give you just kind of a heads up on some, um, the biggest change to note this year is with the home program. They stopped accepting applications on an ongoing basis. And this year they set the deadline. It's actually coming up on November 22nd this year. Um, and then they have set the deadline for next year at for September 15th. So that's a big change that you'll want to note for the home program. For the CDBG program, the planning grant deadline was actually just earlier this week on Tuesday. That is slightly later than it normally is annually, so I would recommend starting to check their website late spring, early summer, because that's more typically when that deadline is or has been in the past. Um, the public facilities grant, their deadline was in March this year, and that is generally where it's about every year or recently. It's late spring, early summer. And then the economic development grant deadlines are, st or economic development grants, excuse me, um, are still accepted on an ongoing basis. But so if you guys have a project that you are considering seeking CDBG funding for, I would just highly recommend you contact myself or Krista at the city well ahead of time and we can work with you to make sure you're meeting all the deadlines that need to be done before grant application as well. Um, and then I will also just kind of jump into the comment period if you're good with that. Um, our county agency on aging director wasn't able to be here today but she asked me to speak on her behalf um, regarding the Big Fork Senior Center. That building out there that the center currently operates out of is in extremely poor condition, to say it nicely. Um, there's an area where the roof is actually lifting up. When we have periods of extended rain, water leaks under the back wall into the dining area. They're constantly having problems with plumbing and electrical systems. Um, the entire facility is not ADA compliant. Um, they also don't have enough parking. Some of their parking is down a steep hill, which is problematic for seniors, especially in the winter months. Um, and just in general, their building is not really laid out well for their use. There aren't any open spaces that they can hold larger community meetings or gatherings or activities. Um, and so we really just at, with the Big Fork Senior Center, they've reached a point where their building is limiting the number and types of services and activities that they are able to provide to the community out there. So Flathead County is currently looking at options for addressing those needs of the center and um, looking for possible CDBG funding as one option just to hopefully get a safe environment out there for those services. Thank you. Hello, I'm Connie Behe, Director of Imaginative Libraries. And I'm going to give you a look at some of the primary issues facing our local libraries and then give you a, an update on our Big Fork Capital Campaign. The most urgent issue facing our libraries in the Flathead County are our facilities. Um, we desperately need new facilities. As Whitney was saying with the Senior Center, we are not ADA compliant in any of our facilities. We are graciously given our spaces through community groups um, here in Kalispell, the School District 5 owns the building, and we have a dollar a year lease. Fantastically generous. I think as we look into the future and what our building and community needs, we can see it's not adequate and possibly a false sense of security for long-term planning. We've had the same space since the 1970s, and you can see how much the community has grown. We have 29,000 square feet that we operate out of and need 55,000 square feet. We regularly get 50 children on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday to our early literacy programs, and that doesn't even count the adults that they bring with them, and you know they take up a lot of space. Um, the county library system overall sees over 1,000 visitors a day. About 800 of those visitors come through the Kalispell location. The others are in Big Fork and Columbia Falls. In Columbia Falls, we see regularly 40 to 50 tweens and teens 
every single day in a 6,000 square foot facility. On Wednesdays every week, it is early out at 1.30. So 1.30 on, we have that number of tweens and teens coming into our facilities. About one-third of the county population has a library card. That is awesome. And we do uh, update our database every year, so we make sure that people are not using their library cards, not to make you feel bad, but we'll take you out of the system. So we have an up-to-date card count. In FY19, we had over 19,000 attendees to all of our library programs, including those literacy programs. Um, with our $1. million budget that we have uh, designated from the county, we get a yield on our investment of ten and a half million dollars. That's using the American Library Association return on investment calculator. Now for a family like mine, this will let you know a little bit about my house. I have a two hundred thousand dollar house and I paid seventeen dollars and fifty three cents for library services in 2018. I just got my tax bill. I know I'd happily increase that. Um, but I can't even take my family to McDonald's for under twenty dollars. So it's about the cost of you know four happy meals for a family like mine. Now, I'm not a usual family because we're in there all the time, and I'm a dedicated public servant who's taking home all these books, so I get $25,000 worth of library services for $17 a year. But your average family gets about $3,000 of library services for that $17 a year. The economic impact that the library has on our communities from working with community partners like the Kalispell Chamber, the school district, FECC, the community health department, the uh, senior center in Big Fork actually is a partner of ours working on a uh, social isolation series, conversation series launching in January. With all of these impacts that we have on the communities, um, we are also focusing on the emerging workforce. We save individual citizens thousands of dollars in life improving materials and in future investment in our facilities is needed so we can keep abreast of all of the changing needs of our community. Sometimes people ask me, are people still reading? And yes, they are. The, the difference is right now is people don't only want to read at the library. They take a look at our menu of offerings and they say, I'll take a print material, a digital material, I'll come to an educational program, I want to use your meeting room, and can you help me find something and let me know if it's a legitimate news source? So it's not just about books, but it certainly is about literacy and making sure everyone has high quality information to lead their lives. I'll update you on Big Fork. Um, our community, our, excuse me, our library foundation purchased a 6,000 square foot building from the Bethany Lutheran Church in, last December. It was a huge step for them, not only because that is investing in this campaign that we're going to build a new library in Big Fork, but because it means they have built the internal capacity to start that kind of fundraising campaign. Uh, let's see, that, that 6,000 square foot, Building is exactly the size that we need according to our 2014 facilities master plan. Right now, Big Fork operates out of about 1,450 square feet. We call it a nano library, but we have a smaller library in Marion. Uh, we have 25 kids in that space at a program, and then we have parents coming in who turn around and walk out because that's just way too many kids in one space to be comfortable. Uh, and, I'm not kidding, staff takes their breaks in a broom closet. It's not a walk-in closet, it's not a fancy closet, it is literally a broom closet that they close the door and people knock on it to see if they can come get them to help them. So, there's a community, <laughs> through our fundraising program, um, we have raised about $400,000 towards a $1.6 million uh, goal. And the Library Foundation plans to own and renovate the building and then turn it over perhaps to the Library County. We're still working on that with the county. Um, if not, they will continue to own it while we operate a public service from that building. Let's see, what else can I tell you? We have, I have been in Big Fork quite a bit this last summer, one to two uh, fundraising events a week. We've pulled back because people are going south right now, but we're in grant writing mode. And we know that there's tremendous community support for the library in Big Fork, and they deserve a great library. That's all I have for you. My name is Margaret Davis. Uh, I own a home in Kalispell, but I live in Lakeside. I'm here on behalf of myself and uh, vital civic infrastructure. The completion of sidewalks on Highway 93 between Flathead Valley Community College and its Highway 2 Idaho intersection should be a priority. Safe connections between the original Kalispell Town site, the west-north or the northwest neighborhoods that are below the hill, 
um, the fast-growing Northern Commercial Center and the Kidsport Complex in the area's largest employer, KRMC and its related medical service providers. These connections are often missing or totally inadequate. Students of all ages and other pedestrians and bike riders need better, safer access to all sections of Kalispell. The goat tracks that serve as paths now are particularly unacceptable in winter conditions. And while a Highway 93 by bypass has eased some of the vehicular traffic on Highway 93 through Kalispell, the City, County, and Montana Department of Transportation should address the sidewalk and pass needs at their earliest opportunity. In addition to Highway 93, two mile, Grandview, Mission, and the internal hospital H1 Zone Street should be upgraded for pedestrian and bike access for the safety of visitors, of uh, senior citizens, and in many cases that these people require ADA uh, compliant uh, ways to get around. So thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jessica Bruinsma. I am the development director with the Flathead Food Bank here in Kalispell. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about our need to procure a new building. At this stage, we have actually outgrown our current facilities. To give you an idea of the scope of the individuals that we serve every year, we serve roughly 10,000 individuals every year, 4,500 families in that. Um, about 80 of those households are in Kyla, Marion, and then also, excuse me, um, as far east as Martin City. Um, we serve roughly 600 kids a week with our backpack program and roughly 800, a little over 800 senior households. One of the things that we are working on right now is not just um, finding a larger facility, but also making better with the space that we have. We want a commercial kitchen so that we can better process and keep the good healthy food that we do get, as well as a processing facility so that we can process game and meat as it comes in for our clients. One of our fundamental beliefs is that every single person deserves healthy, nourishing food. Um, we have a lot of food at the food bank and figuring out how to make the best of what we have, being able to freeze all of the, you know, carrots and broccoli and beautiful things that we get in the summer from various donors and farmers. And making that last longer is integral, not just to our clients, but especially the children that we serve and the seniors. So moving forward, we're hoping to use a CDBG grant to help us achieve those goals. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Stephanie Juno, uh, the loan officer at Montana West Economic Development, or MWED. Uh, MWED is a private nonprofit organization serving businesses here in our community. And we, our mission statement is to cultivate growth and create a positive economic impact through the support of new and expanding businesses in all of the communities here in Flathead County. We do this through being the resource hub for those same businesses of all sizes by not only being a connector to our resource partners, um, but also having and providing solutions for such topics as broadband, infrastructure, workforce training, affordable housing, daycare solution, as well as air and rail service. So MWED actually has um, CDBG funds. We utilize those funds through something called a revolving loan program. And those loan funds are available to businesses, um, typically of all sizes, but we target the small businesses that um, serve our low to moderate income population, um, which creates jobs and hopefully retains those jobs in the long run. So as we lend to those, we bring in our partners, um, such as the county and the city, to provide support to the businesses as they start up, um, and hopefully again through their expansion, and those who are also looking to relocate into the Flathead Valley.
Brian Parker with the Northwest Montana Community Land Trust. Um, the Land Trust is a permanently affordable housing program um, serving the city of um, Started in 2009, we've been a partner with the city for the past 10 years. Um, when we started, we were using uh, neighborhood stabilization funding to purchase distressed properties, rehab them, help pick up, pick up the neighborhood a little bit, uh, and keep the bottom from falling out completely. Um, and when we did that, we, as a nonprofit, kept the land in a trust and sold back the home to low to moderate income individuals in the area. And by doing that, we can gauge a long-term lease that permanently caps the appreciation on the home so that even in a hot market like here, the home remains affordable for generations to come. Um, currently, we have 54 homes in the valley or in the city. Um, the average mean income or the average income for those homeowners is about 77% of the average for the valley. Um, for a family of four, that's about $53,000, which uh, if they were had no debt, could do about 10% of a down payment, that would get them about $200,000 worth of house. Um, as of the last month, the, current, the average home price in the county is $311,000, and I don't think that's going to get any better anytime soon. And so supporting the land trust, we can help to alleviate that problem and expand in the city of Kalispell, and we're also looking to expand out into the valley, particularly in the Columbia Falls area. It's Montana Association of Realtors, and we just hit our thousandth realtor this week, so I feel like there should be some confetti falling from the ceilings or something like that, but actually I'm here on behalf of uh, Brian's organization, which is the Northwest Montana uh, Community Land Trust, and I guess I would just like to start this out with a quote I saw today. This was in Planning Magazine, which just shows that there is a magazine for everybody out there. And um, so this one says, uh, mid-sized cities tackle housing crisis. The United States has a housing crisis, a new report from the National League of Cities confirms. Because of stagnant wages, rising real estate prices, high interest rates, and strict lending, uh, standards housing has become an outsized cost for more and more working families. Renters are particularly burdened with half dedicating more than 30 percent of their income to housing costs. The problem isn't only confined to urban areas like San Francisco and Seattle either. Mayors and other government officials in mid-sized cities are also grappling with the housing affordability. But while the crisis is universal, there is no silver bullet, uh, says they quote the mayor of Bozeman, Montana. Like the challenges that demand them, solutions that take a bespoke approach, and a handful of cities are beginning to make progress. And the Northwest Community Land Trust is just that type of bespoke um, approach. It's different, it's unusual, and it works. It's not solving the entire housing process, uh, crisis here that we have in our Flathead Valley, but it's chipping away, and it's a model that can be uh, transferred not only now from the city limits of Kalispell, but we'd like to expand that outward into the city limits of uh, Columbia Falls, work in the city limits of Whitefish, and into the county. And so for this reason, we would um, ask for consideration of the CBDG grant. I have a letter here, and I won't bore you with the entire details of that, but um, I would just like to read the paragraph that states, um, having a home of one's own is the epitome of achieving the American dream. The Community Land Trust here in Kalispell has provided 54 families a place to call home, and they are now those families out of the rental situation. We'd sure like to provide more families with this same opportunity. So thank you very much for your consideration, and I have copies of that article if anybody cares to read Planning Magazine. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Marnie McCleary. Um, I'm with the Rural Community Assistance Corporation, and today I'm actually here as a board member of the Northwest Montana Community Land Trust to speak in favor of that entity. Um, I had my letter all put together, but Brian's still part of it, Erica's still part of it. So um, I think a couple of things that I'd like to emphasize is that 
When we use the neighborhood stabilization funds in a partnership with the city of Kalispell, um, the grants that we were awarded through the city as a subgrantee totaled $4.5 million, and we are still revolving those funds and acquiring homes and selling homes back to people that can afford them. Um, and as Brian said, the NSP funds were the result of a federal effort to restabilize neighborhoods that were fraught with foreclosed homes as a result of the recession. We concentrated on three communities within the city of Kalispell. And if you drive through those communities now, those subdivisions, you can see a noted difference in the condition of the homes and how they've been taken care of and the success that we had. And as Erica said, and Brian, we have 54 homes, but some of those homes have already been resold once or twice. Um, most families that live in a community land trust home um, stay for approximately eight to nine years, eight or nine years. Um, some stay much longer than that. Um, during, even during the recession, the national average for foreclosures for um, community land trust was only 1%. And that was amazing if you compare it to the overall um, percentage across the United States. Um, the new CDBG revised regulations reflect much of the neighborhood stabilization program regulations. And so what you will see is something very similar in CDBG now to what was NSP. Um, the board and staff of the Northwest Montana CLT with the oversight of NeighborWorks Montana is planning on expanding the land trust by adding more homes within the Kalispell city limits that would be affordable to individuals and families at 80% and below of the area median income. And with NSP program income, families at 50% or below of the AMI, all the way up to 120%. We would like to partner once again with the city and apply for CDBG funds in 2020 to address the critical lack of home ownership opportunities available to the workforce, veterans, and young families in our community. It is our hope that we can contribute to the solution of the housing crisis in our community by expanding these opportunities and utilizing the federal programs available that have been created to address this very critical need. Thank you. I'm Danielle Maiden. I am the resident-owned communities program manager at NeighborWorks Montana. Um, so in the resident-owned communities program, we help folks who live in manufactured housing communities, or you would know them as trailer parks, to purchase their communities and form a nonprofit cooperative. So they run their communities, um, elect their board of directors who do the day-to-day -day operations of those, um, and each household has their own share in the cooperative. They um, meet annually to vote on their budgets and come together to decide on how their community rules are formed, what their bylaws are, um, and we provide the technical assistance to them for 10 years post-purchase, possibly longer, um, if that is something they're interested in. So um, we have 11 resident-owned communities here in the state of Montana. We currently have two under contract that should close within the next two months as well. Three of those communities are here in Kalispell with 89 units of housing within them. As you can imagine, um, many of our manufactured housing communities with investor owners uh, looking at them or owning them um, have infrastructure that is aging um, and needs replacement. So one of our communities, Green Acres Co-op, that is just south of town, they have already utilized CDBG funding I believe about seven years ago to connect their sewer to the municipal system and we expect that their neighbor who shares the fence line, Morningstar, who has been resident owned um, for two years, is going to be applying for a CDBG planning grant with, um, in 2021 and will be looking to connect to the city municipal system within the next three to four years. So that's what we're looking at for the ROC program as far as utilizing CDBG. Um, then I want to change over. <laughs> um, I am also a board member for the Samaritan House, the homeless shelter here in Kalispell, and their executive director, Chris Krager, um, is traveling and was unable to be here today, so I'm going to read a statement from them. 
So the Samaritan House is a local homeless shelter and transitional housing facility in Kalispell. The mission of Samaritan House is to provide for the basic needs of homeless people while fostering human dignity and self-respect. We serve approximately 1,350 people annually. Services offered include shelter, case management, a full cafeteria, clothing and household pantries, as well as other assistance. All of this is offered with the goal of conquering the homelessness our clients are experiencing to fix the problem rather than just sustaining it with temporary services. In 2018, 85% of the clients served in transitional housing at the Samaritan House were no longer homeless when they left the facility. Demand for our services are at an all-time high. The current shelter campus on 9th Avenue West in Kalispell is being utilized at its maximum potential and plans are underway for winter cold weather influx at this location. This means squeezing temporary beds is happening wherever possible in the facility. In January 2018, Samaritan House was awarded the former Sonstali Hall uh, building at one, or 1110 Second Street West. This campus serves to provide administrative offices and the larger kitchen and cafeteria for Samaritan House. This enabled Samaritan House to significantly increase services as well as providing an area for potential growth. The need for more affordable housing in Kalispell has been well demonstrated and Samaritan House is in need of a greater ability to serve local homeless people. The Samaritan House Administrative Center is a logical location for this growth. The Samaritan House would like to move forward adding more transitional and low-income apartments in our efforts to serve people in need. The Samaritan House plans to apply for a planning grant in 2020 um, to be able to provide a, a new engineering report on what is possible to utilize that property. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chana Yokert, and I'm going to continuing, continue the housing trend that we're talking about today. Um, I am a member of the Big Fork Land Use Advisory Committee. I am also helping to form a committee in Big Fork to talk about the affordable housing issues in Big Fork. Um, I am here speaking on my behalf, and I just wanted to put more information on the record uh, from the perspective of an unincorporated community in the Flathead. In October 2018, we hosted a Big Fork Town Hall and asked our community what was the top issue that you see facing our community. The top issue was affordable housing. We also, we had 60 members of the community at that town hall and then we sent out a follow-up survey widely throughout the community and received over 150 responses that too identified affordable housing as the top issue facing Big Fork and the surrounding area. This comes along with uh, the Big Fork Neighborhood Plan that was written in 2007, which identified one of the top go goals is that we would have economic diversity in Big Fork so that there would be housing for all members of our community um, at all income levels. This also has impacts on our businesses in the Big Fork area. This spring, we sent out a survey up through the Big Fork Chamber to the largest employers in Big Fork, for-profit employers. They identified that there were over 100 employees that would move to Big Fork if affordable housing could be found, and these are all moderate income employees. Those 100 employees are at risk for uh, leaving their positions when they find a different position in Kalispell or another location in the, in the Flathead. Our loss is, of course, another community's gain. However, um, we also know that that provides a lot of economic impact on those businesses. From a positive note, Meisinger Designs would nearly double their employees if they could find affordable housing for their moderate income employees. That would mean that they would add close to 70 jobs in our community. So it is fairly significant for us to think about this and we just, I just wanted to put this on, our, on the record so we think about the unincorporated communities in the Flathead. Thank you. First, I apologize for my phone. It's going to be going away next week. It does weird things. I'm Barbara Bradford-Fenchek with Community Kitchen Feeding the Flathead. 
And I would like to bring up the plight of people who are homeless or living in substandard housing. We need to do something a little bit differently than what we've been doing. Tiny House Villages have worked in a lot of places to help people transition. Samaritan House can only go so far because they only have so many resources. And there's also some people who don't thrive in that environment. So there have been interest in tiny house villages and I would like you know I don't have any time to pursue anything like that but I throw it out there is somebody might have the time and the interest and the passion to get something going to where we have a viable place for people to live who are very low income also if we had a stable place for some people some of the people who are currently homeless would work if they could present to a lawyer, you know, to a lawyer, to their prospective employer, oh, I have an address. I have a place where I can stay clean, where I see I'm not going to be overtaken by bed bugs, which is a reality for many people right now, which is, I don't think any of us in this room have been that unfortunate. And another thing that we probably... Since people can't sleep in their cars, there have been places where churches or other entities have opened up their parking lots and provided um, porta potties and places for garbage. Because some of the people who are living in the cars, they're working. We need people who don't have the money for actually any of these programs I think that are being spoken of or something like Meridian Point was supposed to be so great for the lower income people and it's it's a travesty for people who work in a restaurant. There's no way they can even come close to affording it. So we need to be using our creativity which I'm sure there's a lot of that in this room and a lot of it in this city and this county and come up with something where we can provide a way for those who are low income to thrive and become productive citizens and have, be able to have pride in themselves, which is sort of hard to have pride in yourself when you're scratching from bed bugs. Or you have to worry about where you're even going to sleep this night. Thank you. My name is Gabe Skibsrud. I am a private property owner and represent a small group of socially conscious investors that are looking to take two acres. We have adjoining two acres in the city of Kalispell and are just looking for the cooperation of all partners to really maximize the use of that property because the buildings that are on it are um, probably uh, outlive their usefulness. So we're looking at all possibilities of design to maximize uh, the usage of those two acres and put exactly what has been talked about, tiny places that simple restaurant workers and simple workers can afford. And we are committed to keeping those units affordable for infinity because uh, we know that that's, that's more important than the money in our pocket. So we're just, we're just asking for cooperation of all members and, and organizations in the community to, to support and get this started. Thank you. Thank you everyone for sharing today and for taking the time to be here and talk about uh, the important issues in our community. Uh, I wanted to highlight the diverse aspects of subjects brought forth today and I think that really speaks to the CDBG program. Um, and I wanted to say that CDBG dollars help to leverage other development dollars which is critical to projects in our community today. We need partners. The city will be looking to CDBG funding in the future to support the priorities of the core area plan um, as well as the downtown plan. And in closing, thank you again for attending this year's public hearing. And for those of you interested in finding out more about CDBG and home funding, please visit both the state and national websites. Talk to the county, Whitney, talk to, to us here at the city. Um, I think that this hearing serves as a wonderful reminder that when we work to together, we communicate early and we communicate often, we're able to do more good in our community. So thank you all again, and uh, that's it. Thank you.